Adam Gresham, Commissioner of Finance and Management. Thank you for having us in. I sense great interest in, my, in what we are going to talk about, so I appreciate you having us here. So um, last week, or, or the week before when I was here, uh, we were talking about um, the uh, administration's thoughts on uh, education um, cost containment, and I'd mentioned uh, three, kind of our three favorites, uh, one of which was special education that the committee has done work on, uh, one of which was uh, health care, statewide health care bargaining, which I know the committee has also done work on. Um, but I also, uh, the third I mentioned was ratios. And the comment, I think fair comment, came back. And uh, would, so what work have you done on that? Do you have anything to present to us? Do you have language? And um, I said that I would, um, if the committee is interested, I would get back to you on that, uh, which I have. So we've done some work on staff, student ratios uh, within our uh, school buildings, and I thought it'd be appropriate to uh, present to the committee um, if the chair's interested. Yes, please. So, so I think many of you probably know Brad James better than I, um, but he uh, he's done the body of the work. I thought it'd be appropriate for him to present. Thank you. Welcome, Brad. Well, thank you. It's been a while since I've been here, I think. Brad James, Agency of Education, for the record. Um, I need this one for Alice. Thank you, Brad. You're welcome. I, I do remember some things, not, thank not you, many. Brad. Um, was it a week or two ago we were, we were talking with Adam and we, we were asked we were discussing the staff ratios, and we were asked to come up with some preliminary proposal to increase the student-to-staff ratio um, in the state as a whole. Um, and before I take you much further, I, I probably numerous times I'll say staff to student. I mean student to staff every time I say that inadvertently. Um, so we're talking about student-to-staff ratios. So we, we sat and we talked with Adam and got some general ideas as to what was what people were thinking. Talked amongst ourselves um, at the agency and then kind of came up with a draft proposal, which I, I believe is posted. Um, and I have paper copies if folks want them. I've got mine electronic. It's up on the board behind okay. you, but people in the room, if you give them to Marsh, okay. to make sure. Here you go, Marsh. Um, so what, I, what, what this is, just kind of what our thought process was. It has subsequently changed somewhat. Um, but this is basically what I, what I sent over to Adam, I think, that's probably mine, wherever it is. Yeah, yeah, my apologies. There we go. Um, we, we sent it out, I, th I think I sent it over to you maybe Tuesday of last week, something like that. Um, and so I, I've kind of been working on it more or less ever since. Um, basically what we talked about was what would be the appropriate staff members to include in this. Um, and we, we discussed the various staff members and at this point I will pass out a list of staffing. And the ones that are highlighted are the ones that we excluded. Um, we, we took out some of, the, some of the ones that are many people to contract with, so, so um, like food services, transportation, sometimes maintenance operations. Um, we took out enterprise operations, which are self-funding. There are not many people in these things. There's one, there's a facility and acquisition, there's one person in the state titled that right now. Um, so we took out we took out some things that they're down at the bottom of the sheet. I got progress for them. They're, they're down at the bottom of the sheet right here. Okay, that we, that we took out. We also took out pre-kindergarten teachers, and the reason we, and that means we took out pre-kindergarten students too from the student count. The reason we took out pre-kindergarten teachers is because not all the school districts are doing it in the same way. Um, they all have this, the pre-kindergarten student count, but they're not all providing the, the kindergarten in-house to where they actually have a teacher. Oftentimes, they're sending the vast majority of their kids out, or all of their kids out somewhere else. So, as in those ratios that went out back in October, um, we we, pre, we excluded the pre-kindergarten pre also. Isn't we also that, isn't that also true of tuition towns where they tuition yes. students more than pre-K? <coughs> yes, we'll, we'll come to them as, as we get through into this. Um, I'll just finish with staff first. Um, 
And then we had a long discussion about special education. Um, special education is a federal entitlement, as you all know. You also all know that there, you have passed a bill that is out there dealing with special education, health and funding. So we're, we're working on it from that side. So we excluded the special education license staff. So that special education instructors, special education directors, and triple E directors. We excluded them from the count. Um, because we thought there, there'd be no pressure. We, we did include the special education par paraprofessionals. So all the paraprofessionals are still in there. So can those you, are the. Can you distinguish the special ed paraprofessionals from other paraprofessionals? Yes, we can. Assuming that people submit us accurate data. But, but which leads in one point. Um, the numbers that we're going to be talking about very shortly are current year. The school districts were unaware this was going to happen until last week when we got to this point, and I said, what's going on with the, the current year data collection for the teacher staff data? And it had been, it was due in late December, and it, people have been revising it slowly and steadily since then. I sent an email out to business managers back on Thursday saying that I need to have all revisions done by the end of today at which point I'm going to take these numbers and then we're going to come out and those will be the numbers that we're going to use assuming we use numbers for this year. So business manager aware of this as well, our superintendents. I'm a little concerned um, around special ed. Um, the <coughs> best practices recommended that we put forward in our special ed bill actually recommend that we move from paraprofessionals to special educators. So. Um, that that would affect your ratios in some manner. It, what it would do is is because one of the reasons we we included the special pair professionals in the in the staffing count that we're using is because we thought that those will be being pushed down. I see over time, and th and that they probably will become more special education licensed people, director, instructors, teachers, whatever the right terminology is. Okay, thank so you. Th that's kind of what we what we did. Um, and while I'm also thinking about it, because you know how scattered I am, um, the, all these folks that we're talking about here as, as excluding, those are policy questions. <clears throat> okay, so that's, you know, this is just what we put out here for the time being. Um, so that kind of covers the folks that we excluded, and, and a, a very quick rationale as to why we excluded them. There's lots of work in the background that had to get done. Um, I will mention some of them quickly. Um, one of them is we have 15 public technical centers, regional technical centers. Um, 12 of those have a host high school, three of them are standalone. So I treated them differently. For those who were at the host, for those 12 that are at a host high school, I took the students who are going there and, and brought them into that high school as that's where they are for those those full-time equivalents as we count the right. I also subtracted those counts from their ascending school enrollments. So those kids are not there for that time that they're at the Texas. So what happens for a host high school is now you have a larger population that would be more analogous if you actually went and counted everybody, including the technical center, plus all the staff, so that we get the staff with, with those. Um, one thing I did forget to mention, the student counts are doing this kind of goes back to your question, um, Mr. Chair, is, is um, we base this on enrollment, and what we, which, which means that those districts that are tuitioning everybody are not impacted by this because they have no staff. They do have staff at the supervisory union, but we, we, we took those <coughs> and allocated them out based on enrollment. I'll come to that in a short in a, in a moment. So what we did is we, we then, we being me, um, what I did, I'd rather say we, um, for the three standalone technical centers, because I don't see budgets for them, I don't get tax rates for them, their, their cost for people is allocated back out to the districts so that, so that they basically are part of the district's budget. I took the enrollment, again, that semester coming in for the te those three technical centers, I apportioned the technical center staff out to the sending school districts then and left the enrollments where they were. The reason is because I can't calculate a tax rate for one of these standalone tech centers. I can for the sending school. So I apportioned them out based on how many kids are coming. Um, and again, that can all be changed if we want to go forward with this. 
So those were those are the technical centers. Um, the other place where we have probably roughly maybe well not a third but maybe a quarter of the staff is at the supervisory union level. And I allocated those folks out again back to this the sending di the the member districts based on enrollments percentage of enrollment. Okay, so that's kind of how I was allocating the numbers out. So when you look at if if, if I was to show you here's town or school district X, here's the staff. You're going to go what? There aren't that many, but it's it's because I'm forcing people in from other places at times. Um, and from that, I then started calculating ratios. So, have I lost you yet, or do you understand what I'm talking yeah. about so far? I, uh, I don't know how other people do, but I didn't even have that right. I didn't get all of that. It's it's there's a very broad overview in the in the first sheet of paper I sent out. I will, um, it, and it's very broad. But I will I will I will well, okay. I, I I will write it up in a little bit more detail okay. for yeah, you. So that'll be a write up of the allocation. Okay, so now going to what I did afterwards is I, I we, we're now because I'm excluding the special education <laughs> folks. I had no clue what the ratios were going to be for the state. Um, when I did this using FY18 numbers, enrollments, and and staff with these exclusions, I came out with a statewide number of 5.15 student to staff. Oh, I'm told. Higher. Okay, it's higher. Um, which, which I fully expected to be because we were pulling out staff members, not students, but just staff members. I just didn't know where it was going to end up. I then calculated that for everyone and did a quick graph that was a distribution graph of where the folks are. I can help all yours out, thank you. Okay. So it kind of, it, it ranges from a low of 2.99 to a high of, I think it's 7.10 students to staff. Okay. And it's a fairly even distribution. Probably if I was remembered how to do bell curves, it'd probably make a very nice bell curve, but I don't. And I didn't look it up. Um, but the distribution is, is fairly regular. Um, when, you, when you take the average of the averages, in other words, the average ratio of every school district, then that comes out to be 4.77. For the state as a whole, though, which is more of a weighted average, it's 5.15. So I use 5.15 as the starting point for looking. What I then did was I set it up. Can you yes. Tell why is there a difference between 4.77? The 4.77 is if I take the ratio of every school district that I calculated and just took that average, so it's an average of an average. Okay. They're all set to one. Okay. When I look at the state as a whole, Burlington has more kids in it. So they're going to get a bigger share of that of that statewide number. Okay. So the statewide figure is a weighted ratio, or weighted average. Pardon me. Okay, and that's that's why it's higher. The state, the state, if I could put it differently, correct me if I put it incorrectly. The statewide average takes all the students and all the staff, and you divide and yes. you get five point one. I treat it as one, as, a, as one single entity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Exact, exactly. Exactly. And, and the four point seven seven that you take. This school and this this SU and this SU and this SU and this SU and, this SU and, and whatever their ratio is, and you average yes, those together. That is exactly correct. And that's four point seven. That's four point seven seven. Yep. Okay. All right. Representative so Webb has a question. And, and the ratio from the two from the three O to the seven, those represent the the lowest ratio number and the highest. <clears throat> yes, go, go, S, going up. Yep. For SU. No, per per school district. Per school district. Per school district. Okay. This was done at the school district level because, in general, they're the ones more responsible for the hiring. They're, again, at the supervisory union, it's the SU board that does the hiring, but they are responding to the folks in their school in their member school districts. So that's why I expanded them out. And again, what what we ended up doing coming up to with this proposal was trying to come up with a way that was going to make a disincentive for having a low ratio student staff ratio. Representative Miller, is there any correlation? between a 2.99 and a high spending town? 
I did not look at that. Um, I, I would I would have to look at that and see. Um, I, I, I don't know. Um, any other kind of correlation? In there, there. I didn't have time to look at a few correlations I was interested in, but I will, and I'll get I'll get back to okay. them. Can I follow up on that just to yes. since he's following up, up on it? Um, rural. That's close to okay. Rural. And how do we define not rural? <laughs> it's probably other than that one. Yeah, I mean, I, it's a, you're coming up with a number. Okay. Let us know. Yes, fine. Okay. I just I want to make sure I understand this graph, Brad. How so? These are the, the districts that are plotted on here. Yeah, how, yeah, are they, how are they arranged? Small to high. Small to high. Um, it, uh, yeah, I just let Excel do it itself because it, it will do that. Basically, this if, if I expand this enough, you, each of these would be a dot. Right. Okay. Okay. And each dot represents a district, which I just got rid of down here because it's just distracting. Okay. If I if I okay. said you know one two three four five six, there I think I want to say there's 185. I think if I recall correctly. Um, Districts in, in this for FY18. Um, so if, if I was to look, if I was to drill down to that point, that would be some school district. Okay. okay that, that, that's all this is. So it's, it's it's like it's like it's like ranking these low to high, and then just plotting them. That's that's all that I really did here. Okay. 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 So so okay. you're starting with this town, and, and it just it's it's a fairly so that unique. that right there could be a big district or a small yes. district or so a, no, okay. So <clears throat> size size is okay. not showing. Or high spending, spending or low spending. Not, or, morality, okay. is there such a word? Morality okay. does not does not count. Okay. Okay. okay, it's just this is just strictly so there is no there is no domain here. Then. No. Okay, all right. Okay. All right. Yeah. Representative Mellon. The other thing, maybe to look at if you can, is how many special ed kids, special education children are in these districts, and is that why the ratio is so low? So well, I think they pulled special ed. Uh, well, no, we, we, took, we, we did not take out special ed paras. There are roughly 3,000 special ed paras. And I don't remember off the time ahead how many special ed licensed personnel um, there are. But I know there aren't that many. So the, that, that probably could have an impact. Um, again, I did not, I have not sat here and played with this to see who's falling where. Um, Okay. It seems to me, just at a quick look, some of the larger districts tend to be um, <clears throat> up there, and some of the smaller districts tend to be here, but that's not a uniform rule by any means. That's just a quick observation. The, the other thought is that the smaller the ratio, the younger the child. Maybe that the ratio is lower for By grades? Yeah. Well, we, 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 we took, we took out three out. But but I but I will tell you that the lowest one is an elementary school K six. I do remember that. And one. It is an elementary. It is an elementary school grades K <clears> through six. Oh, Representative Jim Batista. Uh, Brad, uh, ratios have been a discussion uh, since around January eighteenth. We heard this from the Secretary of Administration. And at that time, uh, we were talking about a pretty broad proposal that recommended increasing the ratio from one to. Uh, I believe it was 1 to 4.25 up to 1.4.45. But it looks like in the refined methodology here that the agency has been working on with the administration, we can't actually compare this proposal that you're putting forward to what was recommended by the Secretary of Administration in January. Is that correct? That is correct. The, the, the 4.25 was all staff members except for pre -grade. Okay. So just one more question, if I may. So the $30 million that was represented to us is a potential for savings then back in January. Um, those numbers don't correspond to your current proposal. So I'm just trying to get my head wrapped around. Are we able to save $30 million with a proposal of this nature? Well, I'm, I'm coming to that. Okay. okay. I'm kind of slowly, slowly but surely working my way right. forward. Yes. Um, of course, I lost where I was. So, so, <laughs> so uh, to back up what another representative said, are, are you going to uh, modify this chart based on, on the, whether it's a K through six school or a high school? I think I think what would happen is if we started parsing it out into the various grade levels, I think we'd be starting to get pretty small numbers. I'm not sure what validity we would be there. We could certainly do it. Um, it would take some time, but I could certainly do it. 
I'm um, just vaguely recalling, you know, you yep. were before Ways and Means Committee when I was on that committee some number of years ago looking at ratios. I yep. think that report is still on there. I think it was 2011 or something like that. Um, yeah. And at that time, um, there, there were some, we, you felt we couldn't move forward because it was uh, such a mishmash of, uh, so what's changed? And how much does that have to do with elementary schools, Act 46 school districts, larger schools, some of the things that were made it very difficult to move forward uh, some time ago when we looked at this when we were on the Ways and Means Committee. If, and, if, I, and now. If, if I recall correctly, and we're talking the Wayback Machine here, if I, if I recall correctly, we were looking at, at specific categories at, at the school level for, for that study. This is more broad. This is looking at a broader range of staff members. This is from super supervisor union, i.e. superintendent, on down, um, excluding the ancillary services such as buses and food, et cetera. Um, I think what what we were asked to do is come up with a way to, to design a disincentive, for lack of a better term, for having a low ratio so that folks would start to look at what their staffing was, current was, look at it, as, as some people are starting to do now, look at it and see what they can do through attrition, yeah. uh, as opposed to going out and handing out pink slips, but looking at it through attrition, that, that type of thing. So I, I'm not sure you can draw an analogy, to be, a direct analogy between this one and what, what we did six, seven years ago. Um, I might be wrong. I have to go back and, re and, and revisit that. I'm one. sure there's no an analogy. I'm just wondering what's different, what has changed that is going to allow us to move forward where we felt we couldn't. You I, felt, I think I, couldn't I think I think what we're doing now is we're not talking about individual schools. We're talking about school districts, and we're talking about trying to bring the whole statewide ratio up as a whole, as opposed to individual schools, which I think is what we were talking about over there. I think. I think. Yeah. Representative Long, another question. Um, you keep, you're mentioning school districts now, and I wonder how Act 46 is fitting into your um, your scenarios that you're putting out here, because we are in the process of a lot of changes around school districts and whether you have analyzed whether those school districts who actually have become operational have changed their or are in the process of changing their ratios, and whether um, you know how many school districts have voted to uh, merge through an Act 46 um, proposal and have not actually become operational, so haven't had the opportunity to pr propose a budget yet? I mean, the, these yeah, are important no, these, things, these are important right? questions. Yes, I, I agree. Um, I, would, I would say there are probably about 100 school districts, 80 to 100, I don't remember the number off the top of my head, that will dissolve starting July 1 of this year. Okay. We have we have a, a large number of, of, uh, of new unified districts coming in for this coming year. These are FY18 data. Um, okay. So really what you're looking at here is you're looking at eight unified unions and one, one of them is a modified unified union. Um, you're looking at eight unifieds that are in their first year of operation. You, there are three others that are now in their second year of operation in these data. I do know that some of the, the, the two of those have, have you, I should say, I do know for certain that one, I think the second, has, used, has had staff reductions due to attrition and shifting people around as opposed to hiring new people. Right now, I, I understand everybody wants answers about what's happening with the newly merged districts. It, in the first year, it's very difficult to say. In the second year, it's also difficult to say. But I think we will start to see this as we start getting a few more years out. So do you know how many school districts? I'm sorry, if you, can I just follow up? Well, I'd like him to finish, actually, or continue, but if one more it, short it, question. It's, not, it's the same thing. I mean, <coughs> how many school districts are merged but haven't even become operational after this July? I mean, there's still after, some that oh, are, after this there's July. still some that are merging um, in 2019. Yes. Um, I want to say six. That I know that I know five or six. Okay. I'll, I'll fudge it a little bit. Um, Thanks. There, there could be a few more, and then that that will also be the one the state plan comes out to for that year. Right. So that that could change that number. Um, Thank you, Brad. Sorry to stall your. That, that, that's a catch. Yeah. Yeah. We just I'm happen good. to have questions. <laughs> I know this, this committee is always good to have questions. So I, I don't mind. I just lose track of where I was. So that's all right. Um, so anyway, what, what I what I've done, it, what I what I then did was, we were then trying to get to a a an idea of what what um, what cost savings could be or cost reductions could possibly be. 
Um, and so what I did at that point was I looked at the student staff ratio data, which collects salary and benefit data. At the same time, it collects counts of, of teachers in various categories. And I looked at how much was for paraprofessionals and, and how many paraprofessionals were and found an average for them. And I looked at the other staff that we were including and found out what the average was for them also. I then said, OK, if we went from a state ratio of 5.15 to 1 to a state ratio of 5.5 to 1, so we're increasing by 35 hundredths of a student per, per adult, um, what, would, what would happen? And with that, I made an assumption that 60% of the staffing reduction would be paraprofessionals, and 40% would be the remainder. The regular educator, not uh, other staff, I guess, in the proper terminology to use. It's a, it's a very broad category. When I did that, I came up with a reduction in staff of about 938, about, okay, it was 938. Um, roughly 60% of that for paraprofessionals is 560, and the remainder would be uh, other staff. And I came up with a reduction in personnel, salary and benefits of about $45 million. So that was kind of the starting point at which I went. This, the, second, the second phase would then be to say, OK, so if we're going to do this, what kind of a disincentive are we going to give the districts that have low ratios? What are we going to have them push it up? The best we could come up with was a, I don't know what to call it, um, a fee or a penalty or a surcharge or something on their education spending before the tax rates are calculated. On their, uh, pardon me? On their education spending okay. be before tax rates are calculated. We thought that would be more transparent than doing it like the excess spending threshold, which comes, which is a little bit convoluted and comes later on, or doing it on the tax rate itself. We thought it would be more transparent to say, your, sp your education spending is a million dollars. If you have a low student to staff ratio, we're going to add money to that, and then we're going to calculate your tax rate. We thought that would be more transparent. Mm -hmm. Which would uh, push up, the effect of that would be to raise tax rates in communities that had low Correct. staff, low student to staff ratio. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Um, the methodology I came up with to do that, and again, more policy decisions if we go forward with this. The methodology was, I, I said, if, we, if we're using, if we're using a ratio of 5.5 uh, to 1, if your district comes in at 4.5 to 1, the difference is one student okay, per adult. That's the difference. And so the way I set it up was for every student, in other words, if you're one student, then you get a 2% surcharge on your education spending. So if your education spending was a million dollars, your ratio came in at 4.5. The ratio, the target ratio is 5.5. You'd add 2% of that to be a million twenty two hundred, a million twenty thousand dollars, and your tax rate be calculated on that. Then. Okay. And again, that can that can that's policy decision. And then that starting with that point, then it would just be prorated. If, if you if you're half a student over or under the ratio, then it'd be one percent. If you're three quarters of a student, it'd be 0.75%. If you're two students, it'd be 4%. So it just prorated from that point on. Could I yes. just sure. make the comment? These are, we're looking at it. These are not proposals that we want to put down on the line and say, this is what the administration is. We're, we're trying to come up with ways to do this. Um, but we haven't fully vetted these, and I just want to make sure that's clear. Representative Webb. As you um, move forward to consider this, um, I'm looking at your number of 45 million that you could save by reducing staff by 938, which would include 560 parents, in what you said. That would mean simply removing paras and not accounting for the fact that there's a very good chance that there needs to be increased staff elsewhere. Yes. I can tell you that in my own, my own district, um, following the work that they did with BMG, 
they were able to replace 21 paraeducators mm -hmm. with seven mm -hmm. uh, special educators. So did a great job in reducing personnel, that it, but had zero financial impact. Did a great job of, of improving the quality of services for kids that did not end up having a did not end up having a, a financial impact based on staffing may have an impact on future results mm -hmm. for that right. child, but not on staffing. Mm -hmm. So this is really looking at if these people just left and there wasn't a replacement. Is the way these numbers are. <laughs> yes, yes. yes. I, I, I'm operating under kind of that blunt instrument right. thing right now. You're the numbers guy. <laughs> Thank you. But yes, the, you're, you're correct. That's so how that's working right now. Consider that as you're, as Adam, as your folks are, are thinking about policy, to just keep that in mind. Um, particularly with the work that's been done with a special ed bill. Okay. Okay. I think I'll send you to tell you. Um, we, we, we don't think this can really be realistic for this coming year, which I think is what Adam was saying, is that this is a, a further out thing. Um, it might be the type of thing you would want to look at and kind of work up to it over the course of a couple of years, make this a five, part of a five-year plan or something like that. But I'll let Adam and crew make those discussions. You're welcome. So to that point, Great. what's your timeline? We do think this is part of a comprehensive plan. In other words, th this along with other discussions we've had, for example, on health care, for example, on special education. And, you know, we would ask to roll this out um, this session and take five years to let it grow. Um, so this would be a five-year plan that I think progressively over the five years we would be able to see an impact um, and we would hope that we could stick with it for that long. You know, we think, again, this is one part of a plan. I mentioned earlier that we were looking at staff ratios, and you mentioned we looked at health care and special ed, and we think they all have to be a comprehensive plan. We don't think one only, you know, putting one in isolation is a good way to go about it. So, so can you help me understand where 30 or $40 million of one-time money comes in the play? that's been described right. as how we conclude the, our work <clears throat> this year? Uh, this is not related to one-time money. This has no bearing on one-time money. In other words, we're not assuming any savings in fiscal 19. We are assuming savings going forward, fiscal 20 and so on. Um, but this <coughs> has no relation to one-time money. So my conundrum is that here we are, we've, we've done what I believe is very good work, and I think you supported that work on our special ed bill. <coughs> We're continuing to work on school employee health care, um, and, and we have a proposal from, from you to the, the outline of, a, a, of how we might deal with ratios, none of which will raise, save money next year. So, uh, and, and yet I still hear that we, are, we have to come up with 30 to 40 million dollars before we get done here this year. So these don't help. Well, how am I, how am I going to come up with 30 to 40 million dollars between now and the end of the session? Fair question. So the context is, our view is if we do come up with one-time money, as I believe the governor had said he was considering, it would have to be in combination with a comprehensive plan so we're not sitting in this room next year and the year after. And in addition, the fact that we need additional money to keep tax rates stable would indicate that the base is off. You know, as the chair has pointed out before, last year we kept rates stable by using a surplus in the fund this year, we're back in the same position. So what we're hoping is by putting money in to stabilize tax rates and enacting a comprehensive plan to ensure that we don't have to sit here every year, um, that would be 
part of the whole package. Otherwise, you know, I'm in agreement that just, you know, putting excess money into the Ed Fund to stabilize rates is really not particularly helpful because next year we'll be back in the same position. So the reason we're asking for this is because we believe that it should be part of a plan um, that will also stabilize tax rates <coughs> this year. I'm trying to listen at the same time. I have, I'm trying to read this proposal. Would you be able to kind of go through this proposal? Which one? I'm seeing that. Is that the anti second proposal? Oh. I'm just having a hard time reading and listening at the same time. Okay. Do we have that in front of us as well? Yes. That should be. That's, that's, page two. that's it. Two of the original memo. Whatever you want to call it, document it. Okay, I, I will go through that. And again, I'll, I'll highlight where I deviated from this as I worked and ran into problems. And there were so. Um, so the first, the first part's the rationale. Um, the, the majority of education spending is in salaries and benefits, as, as everybody knows. Um, it's not to say that that you know folks shouldn't be there, but it's just that's that's just the reality. Um, if you were to decrease the overall student-staff ratio in the state, then theoretically education spending should come down. Would it be a one-to-one -one correlation? Probably not, because so many school districts have made some, such large cuts. They probably use some of those unanticipated expenditures in a different fashion to bring things back to the kids. But it still gives you a general idea. Um, that's just, okay. I'm, I'm going to jump down to the proposed staff exclusions. That's what I was talking about when I first came in. This is the group of folks that, that we um, excluded. And I put numbers in there just so you can see what they were. With operations and maintenance, it's just over 1,000 staff. Um, student transportation, about just under 300. Food service, about 500. Enterprise operations staff, about 68. Again, the enterprise operations is where they kind of fund themselves. So they're not really there anyway. They're after school sometimes. Community service, again, they're like oper their enterprise operation. They're similar to enter enterprise operations, what business managers told me, you know, roughly 30, and one facilities and construction staff. So those are the ones we, we cut out. We also took out the pre kindergarten teachers, again, because not all school districts are operating a pre kindergarten program, even though they're responsible for providing pre kindergarten. So we, we exclude them because that was another apples to pineapples type thing. Um, with special education, it's a federal entitlement. So we thought these people need to be there. We also realized that there's H897, which is moving forward, which, which we supported. I believe it helped quite a bit. Um, and so that's working on changing how special education is, is delivered and structured. And so, based on the two studies that, that the legislature um, funded, that those working together should bring costs down over time. So we excluded special education teachers, we excluded special education directors, and essential early education directors. Number 11, you can cross out, we did not spe exclude special education paraprofessionals. Again, we thought that was going to be addressed largely by the the, some of the, the education bill, uh, special education bill itself. Um, the next one that I have, this is, again, I was doing this off the top of my head when I did this that night. Um, it's not really organized in the way I was thinking about it ultimately, but the next one I have is supervisory union staff. And especially with Act 153 and 156, a number of super, a number of what used to be district staff are now at the supervisor union level. Special education and transportation are all at the supervisor union level now. So we have quite a few folks at the supervisor union level, and what we have to do is we have to allocate them back out to the to the member school districts of that supervisor union. We did that by basing it on enrollments. I looked at the enrollment for any given school district versus the percentage of the enrollment from its SU. And I allocated staff back out in that fashion. So if, if a school district had 20% of the enrollment of an SU, they got 20% of the staff added to their own staff. 
so that we're bringing it back down to where the tax income is. Same thing with career technical education. Um, again, this, this became a little bit more involved, which I kind of went over first. <clears throat> I separated the 15 public regional career technical education centers into the 12 that are hosted at, at public high schools, <clears throat> excuse me, and the three that are standalone technical center school districts. The 12 that are on the host high school, I took the most recent semester full-time equivalent student, which is similar to an enrollment basis, basically. Um, I subtracted those students from where, whatever school, host high school they were coming from, or sending school they were coming from, so that, that went down. I added those students to the host high school because that's where the staff was in the, in the technical center. Then for the three standalone technical centers, I did the exact opposite. I looked at the ratio of, again, enrollment for ascending district to the total enrollment, or first semester for the standalone technical center. I found that percentage again, call it 10%, and I gave them 10%, I gave that ascending district 10% of the standalone district's staff, because we don't, we're, I don't directly do anything with the, the standalone techniques. <coughs> so it has to go back to the folks who are making the decisions as to how many people to support. That's, that's the sending districts. Tuitioning districts um, <coughs> were left out of this because they don't have staff. They do have staff at the SU, but they don't have enrollment. We figured, we thought that, that there was no way to get to them in, in, this, in this way. Same thing with the independent schools. Um, we, we don't we don't do anything with them directly, so we didn't go there. We didn't try anything with that. We don't have the data to to get to this level of detail. The proposal then has again most of these are kind of policy decisions. The proposal I'm on the last page now. Um, the, the first policy decision would be determine which staffing categories to use. I'm, we, we made our decisions, that's what you're, see, you're seeing here. Um, we then allocated staff to the operating district based on enrollment percentages. Calculated that, you know, I'm number three, calculated the 2018 student staff ratios for the state as a whole and the effective student staff ratio for the operating districts. I'm using the word effective just because it's not their real staff, it's not necessarily their real enrollment because we've had these manipulations in there. I then used the student staff ratio for the state as a starting point for the target ratio. Again, that was 5.15 to 1. And when I ended up going to 5.5 is the 45 million. If the district was under the target ratio by, by 1, i.e. a whole student per staff, then I increased education spending by 2%. And I prorated it if it, there were more or less. Okay? If you were over the, the staff, then you're just the way you are. Or the ratio, you're just the way you are. And then the rationale behind it was, we thought, in, and on number six, increase in education spending would be more transparent to voters and taxpayers than any other way we could think of. Um, the increase would occur before the tax rate calculation. The increase in education spending would then flow, I feel like so many people I don't, I never come in here and read things to you, I apologize. Um, the increase in education spending would then flow through to the district tax rate. The increased education spending drives up the cost per pupil and the increased cost per pupil increase in the tax rate. That's how it would work. That's, that's the proposal that I came up with. Is it, is it fair, uh, appropriate to characterize this as a different kind of high spending threshold based on ratios rather than on per pupil on merely on per pupil spending? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I would, I would say it's similar to the high spending. Yeah, it's, 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 an, it's somewhat analogous to that, based on low ratios. It's a, <clears throat> I, I don't know what you want, want to call it, low yeah. ratio disincentive. Yeah. We've thought about it going, being essentially the same thing in another direction. In other words, another way of getting at the same, and maybe it would be duplicate. Yeah. So. I think, um, the notion that this committee has had is uh, in replacing, I mean, the high spending threshold is problematic. So thinking about new ways to do it, this being one way, yeah. I, I think our committee has looked at uh, the tax consequence of each dollar rather than having a threshold 
it, in this case it's 5.5 .5 to 1, is that what you're Yeah, doing? that's what I was used for modeling. Instead of having a, a threshold saying for each dollar over the base calculation amount or over the yield that a district chooses to spend, there's a higher tax consequence than there currently is now. And that's what did 9-11. Um, and the notion there is that um, because there's a higher tax consequence for each and every dollar over the base that a school district uh, spends, there's a higher tax consequence that people won't, school districts won't spend right up to some sort of threshold and then and then stop there. That it's sort of, sort of free money up to this threshold, whatever threshold we put in place, and then there's this big penalty so people don't cross over the threshold. And that's kind of what's happening with, with our high spending threshold currently. Is, is that right, Brad? Yeah, yes. I mean, I, you know, I'm one of the deals with it all the time. It's, it does get everybody's attention. It's, again, kind of like what I was describing here. It's kind of a blunt instrument. Um, it's not, it, 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 to work better, it should be more tailor-made to individual school districts. Um, that would take a lot of work. We have some ideas, but I just have never sat down and worked on it. Um, but it's th when there's just a threshold, you're correct. Some some districts do go right up to just below that threshold. That's where they sit. So as the threshold goes up, they go. Yes. So you're correct. Yes. Um. So so along those lines, um, do you know, or I might ask you as well, do you know um, the reason why some of those school districts are at seven and some are at three? The ratios. I mean, have you? Uh, no. I, okay. I have not had so, time to parse it out. So then, my question is more around um, <laughs> sort of history of public education in Vermont. And, you know, we have, you know, I grew up here, um, we've always powerfully supported um, public education and and I would say that this year we saw an awful lot of support coming from our districts for school budgets. 97%, I think, passed them on the first try. Um, I think we believe deeply in you know, supporting our public education system. This is a pretty significant shift from that. It's taking decisions that we have always strongly supported at a local level, letting local voters make decisions. I mean, we let them make decisions about curriculum. We set the standards at the state board level, but we let them make decisions around curriculum and materials at the local level. And we've always allowed that in spending. This seems like a significant shift from, for us, um, heading in this direction, for, for Montpelier, frankly, to be taking over um, the staffing of our buildings. And I'm really struggling with that. Great. I mean, we spoke about this before. You know, Montpelier has taken over the taxing of our schools. So we feel that the state has a very direct interest in the operation of the schools. And, you know, I say that reluctantly, but definitively. I mean, we have a statewide tax rate. We have a statewide tax rate. So we have a direct interest in the resources we're putting in schools. So. Brad, do you have a district by district output of these? You, you, you showed the graph, so you you have that in a chart form. So and not with me. Look at my districts. Not with me. <coughs> Could you supply that to yes. me, please? Senator Boyd has a question. Where I struggle with some of this proposal is it seems like it's focusing on a symptom as opposed to what's underlying the reason that <coughs> some areas have low or high staff ratios. And that we at the state, I think, are probably wiser to focus on uh, the whys, what's driving those ratios, and addressing what it is that's driving those ratios. It, it's, it's like saying, just give everybody antibiotics without finding out that actually there's, a, you know, there's an invasion of, of something, <clears throat> some disease, that if you actually dealt with that, you might not need so much penicillin. I, I always get worried when I use an analogy. Um, <laughs> Concrete steps come to mind. <laughs> Concrete steps. <laughs> um, so when I hear this, I, I think that what we have been trying to do is actually focus on some of the things that are driving those costs, 
driving the reasons that we need staffing, uh, that, that we need to look at staffing. And I'm just wondering if the best use of what we could do now would be to see Act 46 through get the special ed bill and, and census model funding in place bring in DMG, oh, excuse me, bring in uh, a group similar to DMG who uh, could help our schools look at uh, how to address some of our, our needier students. And then at the same time, acknowledge the school boards for doing what they did to not only reach the governor's goal, but to surpass it substantially. That would be what I would think we at the state, that would be the best use of our energy and time as opposed to getting into the nitty gritty of, of this counting that, you know, like I said, we can deal with it. Get rid of 21 paraeducators and hire seven professionals. We've just managed your thing around ratios, but we haven't done a darn thing about cost. So I, I just, I, I I can see where you could certainly set up some of this counting, which I think is appropriate, and counting it maybe the way you're doing it, um, and then use that as a measure of how we're doing, but not tying everybody to making those changes, but actually use it as a, use it as a measure as opposed to a, a, a policy. So, Brad, I... Um I appreciate your work on the methodology mm -hmm. here. I think it's it's pretty thorough and thoughtful. Um, my concern is, what do, how do what do we compare this to? Like, how does this compare to our private schools in the state? How does this compare to public schools in other states? Um, is there is there a way uh, to do that? I mean, do we do we have an understanding that 5.5 is the right number? No. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing quite like this national. Excuse me, nationally. National data are looking at specific categories of, of teachers primarily, and that and and they're trying to come up with a a common methodology for all states so that they can actually compare them. But they have the same issues that we have trying to talk to districts sometimes and how they do things. It's, everybody does it a little bit differently. So the federal government's working hard, and that's sometimes why it takes two years to get information out, getting comparable data between the 50 states and the outlying districts. Um, is there anything that's looking at overall staffing versus just teachers? Not to my knowledge. There might, doesn't mean that there isn't, but not to my knowledge. I have not researched it. Is there anything that has gone to the level where I just did, where I said we're going to exclude these categories? Probably not. Um, what do we compare it to? Is that the right number? I can't, I can't answer that question. Um, I, I just, I, I can't. What about, what about teacher to student ratios? That's what I sort of hear the most about. Do we have do, do we know what that is in the state? And do, is that comparable to other states yeah, or that, to our private that, schools? That, that would be more comparable. Um, hard to believe, I'm sitting here laughing at myself now. It's hard to believe that did not actually look at the state <coughs> teacher staff, the direct instruction versus versus students. Uh, it, I just didn't. I mean, I have it set up so that I can, but I it did not do it. Um, I can tell you what that is for FY18 with the direct instruction. And then follow along with that, what I said just a moment ago was I'll, I don't off the top of my head I do not know what the federal folks use when they're comparing across states for their for their staffing ratios that, that we see that it compares us to but I could probably find that out and then I could probably see where, where we where we stand that would be helpful information I think for the committee and and, and, uh, and the question that representative long asked earlier I think it was representative long was, do we have any notion why some one school district is at 2.99 and another school district is over seven? I mean that's it's enormous. It, it is an enormous, enormous difference from one school district to another. My my guess and, and the answer is no. I have not looked at it. I've not taken the time to look at it because all this takes time. Time was not quite readily available for this. Um, 
But I, I think I think a lot of it's going to have to do with how the supervisory unions are operated. Um, because remember, a lot of what we're seeing here is, is being pushed out from the supervisory and back down to the school districts. Yeah, yeah. So, and 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 then that that would involve rationale from from folks that I know say, why do you have these people here? Why do you have this many people? We can find all this out. Not not happily because they won't be happy telling me this information. <laughs> but, but but we could we could find a lot of this out. Let me first put it that way. Um, but, but off the top of my head, I, I don't know. I could probably look at the towns and the districts and look at the staffing categories in the background data and come up with some reasonable ideas, but I truly don't know. And I have the feeling it's going to vary from place to place to place. Well, it, it may. On the other hand, we might see, you know, we've talked about um, the number of uh, unified districts that we have. You know, if they're all in the lower half and the ones at the very top are all districts that operate no schools and just do tuition. I don't I don't have any reason to expect this. I'm not putting that out as an expectation, but that would tell us a whole lot about how uh, how the Act 46 process is happening or not. Um, it would tell us whether um, whether there's a differential between public schools and, and tuitioning out to to private institutions in state and out of state. I know one of the provisions we've got from the Senate is, is putting some small circumscribing around how we spend public dollars outside the state. So, you know, this is a good piece. It, it needs to have a lot more context uh, for me to understand how we might utilize this piece in a, in a piece of legislation. Yeah. Representative Jim Batista. Uh, are you seeking... Oh, 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 I'm sorry, please. I forgot to. Well, let, <laughs> let go, ahead, go, go and then you. Okay, okay. Couple, couple questions uh, just raised from the proposal. Are you seeking legislation to put us on a long-term path? I know Secretary Young talked about a five-year plan uh, toward attrition. Is, is this the first piece of that proposal? Uh, this would be one piece. Okay. Um, and so I'm wondering about this. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out how we conclude session in a timely fashion. Um, and so if you're seeking part of a package of legislation for future years, um, have you explored the future year impact of this proposal on the general fund? We have. Okay. Okay. Um, assuming that it's something that you can support based on the proposal before us, do you feel like it's appropriate under 5A, it says that the, the increase can be characterized as a fine, a tax, a penalty, or a surcharge on low student-staff ratios. Do you think the best way to get at this issue of ratios and wanting a statewide policy change would be instituting a fine, a tax, a penalty? Uh, like I said earlier, uh, this is, we're just trying to lay out some thoughts on this. We haven't come down on anyone. Yeah. I mean, our tax code is filled with <laughs> fines, penalties, taxes. Have, for example, the excess spending threshold. We have the allowable growth limits. Yep. Um, we have, I guess, if I thought fast enough, I could probably come up with a couple more. So, you know, this isn't foreign territory. Um, but the question that we have uh, in the administration and what we are hoping to figure out is what is the best way to do it? I, I was searching for a word there. I didn't have one. So I guess my only question then, if we're seeking enabling legislation this year for a five-year plan, um, within that legislation, would the governor be supportive of a fine, a tax, or a penalty on districts that have these ratios? So is your question, the governor has said he doesn't want a new tax, and there's a tax up there, is that what you're getting at? I'm wondering if... So we would yeah. figure out a way to not make it a tax, because it's not a tax. It's a penalty. <laughs> okay. Pardon? Thanks. I mean. Representative Miller. Are you watching how Act 46 is continuing to do? Do you have an update on what the tax, the budgets have come in at of late? We, the last we heard from Mark was they've increased by 1.5, 2% less than a few years ago. Yes. It's 3.5. And that's saving us 28 
million dollars. Have you looked to see if it's getting any better, any worse? We, I, I updated those numbers maybe a week or so ago, um, and they haven't changed significantly. The, the ones who came in were smaller and didn't really move the needle at all. It's still around 1.5%. How many 1. Are still out of bread? I think eight. How many? Eight. Eight? Eight. Well, that was a sign of incredible success. I admit. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. I, I mean, the, the, the so, so if we, if we can keep doing that, saving that 28 million each year, keeping, the, keeping this down, and if we can be patient and see how the hard work we did here on special education comes out, as Kate so eloquently described, why isn't that a better idea than going into something so complicated that will probably drive the school districts crazy? Sorry to say well, that. But most of what I do does. Yes. So. This <laughs> constant changing things for them is just, I mean, they came through in such a beautiful way, such a helpful way this year. I think they have the message. So why not let these things <laughs> Why don't we just take our time and let's see how this comes out. This may solve our problem. If we're patient. Uh, Representative Joseph. This, um, I don't want to teach you too much about this, Adam, but this thing that might be called a tax, would this be an increase in property taxes? No, actually, yeah. this proposal is to level property taxes. Oh, That's really? I thought the, the percentage increase, these, you're talking about percentage increases here. Right. Those are increases that will be realized through what? A percentage increase in, in property taxes? What the proposal does is it levels state the average statewide property tax. Oh, but for, okay, but for the people who have the ratios that are low, they're going to have an increased property tax. And for people who have ratios that are high, mm -hmm. they will have a reduced property tax that otherwise it wouldn't, they wouldn't have. So the average statewide property tax rate will be the same. A master, Representative Conn. Representative Conn. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to echo the argument for patience um, that Representative Miller made. I was just looking at the um, four supervisory union school districts um, in my district and what happened this year uh, in um, Addison Northeast, uh, the district where Representative Sharp is from, they cut 16 and a half people. District I'm from, 23 people. <coughs> another district that's in my legislative district, 17 people. Um, another one in Addison County, uh, 14 people over the past uh, three or four years. Um, so I think that I got a little jumpy at the beginning of this when it said the proposal was to um, encourage districts to closely look at staffing levels and decrease them where necessary and possible. It's kind of uh, asking people to do what they seem to be doing a very, very good job of so far. Uh, I couldn't help but bristle at that suggestion a little bit. Um, all right, that's pontificating. Uh, I do want to go back to um, uh, the question about enabling legislation. I mean, what is it you're talking about? We're suggesting get done for this year in this legislative legislative session. I'm unclear on that. You kind of said roll something out this year. Uh, we'd be happy if the committee is interested. We'd be very happy to roll this out ASAP. And this being essentially that, but in proposed bill form. I, I, just one more thing. Uh, I will say that um, I keep thinking about the unintended consequences. And so, for example. Um, Excluding special ed staff uh, sort of goes against um, the, the um, our special education bill, which is really encouraging school districts to use their special education money in ways that are more effective. And sometimes that is to use specialists that who aren't necessarily special educators um, to help target special education. Um, and uh, this would sort of provide a bit of a perverse incentive to. Yeah. Uh, not be creative and to keep things somewhat status quo. Right. Mm -hmm. I think Representative Miller uh, question. In my district, we didn't come in at 1.2 percent. We we were down by 1.2 percent in our budget. 
our class, I check our enrollment numbers quite frequently in Shaftesbury. Our classroom sizes are 19, 20, 21, 22. We're doing a great job. Keeping control of costs and providing a quality education to our kids. Instead of going after everybody and annoying everybody, why don't you look at the people who are not achieving what you want? Why don't you go and look That's at exactly the what he's proposing to do. Look at the 2.99. That's exactly what you're going to find out why that is. Yeah. Are those the high spending tabs? Are they the special? Whatever the reason, you're going to do that? So that's what, what the said? proposal, uh, the proposal, yeah, that's is, what the proposal to, is to have a penalty for what, low. What, no, I'm not what, saying what, no, penalty. What, no, what, no. I shouldn't you say something You should say No, no, Rep. Senator is saying something different. She's saying what is the reason behind these What numbers? is the reason? As opposed to don't coming do up with anything punishing. <clears throat> and don't do anything punishing yet. Find out why, and then we can figure out what to do. But can I also, to the member from Middlebury, yeah, answer sorry, his yeah, question? Formal. Formal. You moved? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, it's kind of like, just because everyone drives safely doesn't mean you don't need to speed them. And those districts that are doing everything according to plan and whose plans are good, they shouldn't care. I mean, when I'm out driving, I don't care whether the speed limit is 55 or 60 because I'm a safe driver. Well, so this shouldn't... $40 million of one-time money comes into play here, that's been described right. as how we conclude the, our work <clears throat> this year. Uh, this is not related to one-time money. This has no bearing on one-time money. In other words, we're not assuming any savings in fiscal 19. We are assuming savings going forward, fiscal 20 and so on. Um, but this is, has no relation to one time. So my conundrum is that here we are, we've, we've done what I believe is very good work, and I think you supported that work on our special ed bill. <coughs> We're continuing to work on school employee health care, um, and, and we have a proposal from, from you to the, the outline of, a, of how we might deal with ratios, none of which will raise, save money next year. So, and, and yet I still hear that we, are, we have to come up with 30, 40 million dollars before we get done here this year. So these don't help. Well, how am I, how am I going to come up with 30 to 40 million dollars between now and the end of the session? fair question. So the context is, our view is, if we do come up with one-time money, as I believe the governor had said he was considering, it would have to be in combination with a comprehensive plan, so we're not sitting in this room next year and the year after. And in addition, the fact that we need additional money to keep tax rate stable would indicate that the base is off. You know, as the chair has pointed out before, last year we kept rates stable by using a surplus in the fund. This year we're back in the same position. So what we're hoping is by putting money in to stabilize tax rates and enacting a comprehensive plan to ensure that we don't have to sit here every year, um, that would be part of the whole package. Otherwise, you know, I'm in agreement that just, you know, putting excess money into the Ed Fund to stabilize rates is really not particularly helpful because next year we'll be back in the same position. So the reason we're asking for this is because we believe that it should be part of a plan um, that will also stabilize tax rates <coughs> this year. I'm, I'm trying to listen at the same time. I have, I'm trying to read this proposal. Would you be able to kind of go through this proposal? Which one? I'm seeing that. Is that the anti septic proposal? I'm just having a hard time reading and listening at the same time. <laughs> 
Shouldn't we have that in front of us as well? Yes. That should be. Yeah. Last page. page two. That's it. Two of the original memo. Uh, Thank you. Whatever you want to call it. Document. Okay. I, I will go through that. And again, I'll, I'll highlight what where I deviated from this as I worked and ran into problems, and there were some. Um, so the first, the first part's the rationale. Um, the, the majority of education spending is in salaries and benefits, as, as everybody knows. Um, it's not to say that that you know folks shouldn't be there, but it's just that's that's just the reality. Um, if you were to decrease the overall student-staff ratio in the state then theoretically, education spending should come down. Would it be a one-to-one -one correlation? Probably not, because so many school districts have made some, such large cuts. They'd probably use some of those unanticipated expenditures in a different fashion to bring things back to the kids. But it still gives you a general idea. Um, that's just, OK. I'm, I'm going to jump down to the proposed staff exclusions. That's what I was talking about when I first came in. This is the group of folks that, that we um, excluded, and I put numbers in there just so you can see what they were. With operations and maintenance, it's just over 1,000 staff. Um, student transportation, about just under 300. Food service, about 500. Enterprise operations staff, about 68. Again, the enterprise operations where they kind of fund themselves, though they're not really there anyway. They're after school sometimes. Community service, again, they're like oper they're enterprise operation. They're similar to enter enterprise operations, what business managers told me you know, roughly 30, and one facilities and construction staff. So those are the ones we, we cut out. We also took out the pre-kindergarten teachers. Again, because not all school districts are operating a pre-kindergarten program, even though they're responsible for providing pre-kindergarten. So we, we excluded them because that was another apples to pineapples type thing. Um, with special education, it's a federal entitlement. So we thought these people need to be there. We also realize that there's H897, which is moving forward, which which we supported. I believe we helped quite a bit. Um, and so that's working on changing how special education is, is delivered and structured. And so based on the two studies that, that the legislature um, funded, that those working together should bring costs down over time. So we excluded special education teachers. We excluded special education directors and essential education directors. Number 11, you can cross out. We did not spe exclude special education paraprofessionals. Again, we thought that was going to be addressed largely by the, the some of the, the education bill, uh, special education bill itself. Um, the next one that I have, this is, again, I was doing this off the top of my head when I did this that night. Um, it's not really organized in the way I was thinking about it ultimately, but the next one I have is supervisory union staff. And especially with Act 153 and 156, a number of super, a number of what used to be district staff are now at the supervisory union level. Special education and transportation are all at the supervisory union level now. So we have quite a few folks at the supervisory union level. And what we have to do is we have to allocate them back out to the to the member school districts of that supervisory union. We did that by basing it on enrollments. I looked at the enrollment for any given school district versus the percentage of the enrollment from its SU. And I allocated staff back out in that fashion. So if, if a school district had 20% of the enrollment of an SU, they got 20% of the staff added to their own staff so that we're bringing it back down to where the taxing entity is. Same thing with career technical education. Um, again, this, this became a little bit more involved, which I kind of went over first. <clears throat> I separated the 15 public regional career technical education centers into the 12 that are hosted at, at public high schools, <clears throat> excuse me, and the three that are standalone technical center school districts. The 12 that are on the host high school, I took the most recent semester full-time equivalent student, which is similar to an enrollment, basis, basically. Um, I subtracted those students from where, whatever school, host high school they were coming from, or sending school they were coming from, so that, that went down. I added those students to the host high school 
because that's where the staff was in the, in the technical centers. Then for the three standalone technical centers, I did the exact opposite. I looked at the ratio of, again, enrollment for ascending district to the total enrollment or first semester for the standalone tech center. I found that percentage again, call it 10 percent, and I gave them 10 percent. I gave that ascending district 10 percent of the standalone district's staff because we don't work. I don't directly do anything with the, the standalone tech <laughs> centers. So it has to go back to the folks who are making the decisions as to how many people to support. That's that's the sending districts. Tuition districts um, <clears throat> were left out of this because they don't have staff. They do have staff at the SU, but they don't have enrollment. We figured we thought that, that there was no way to get to them in, in this in this way. Same thing with the independent schools. Um, we, we don't we don't do anything with them directly, so we didn't go there. We didn't try anything with that. We don't have the data to, to get to this level of detail. The proposal then has, again, most of these are kind of policy decisions. The proposal, I'm on the last page now. Um, the, the first policy decision would be determine which staffing categories to use. I'm, we, we made our decisions. That's what you're, see, you're seeing here. Um, we then allocated staff to the operating district based on enrollment percentages. Calculated the F, you know, number three, calculated the 2018 student staff ratios for the state as a whole and the effective student staff ratio for the operating districts. I'm using the word effective just because it's not their real staff. It's not necessarily the real enrollment because we've had these manipulations in there. I then used the student staff ratio for the state as a starting point for the target ratio. Again, that was 5.15 to 1. When I ended up going to 5.5, is the 45 million. If the district was under the target ratio by by one, i.e., a whole student per staff, then I increased education spending by two percent, and I prorated it if it, there were more or less. Okay, if you were over the, the staff, then you're just the way you are, or the ratio, you're just the way you are. And then the rationale behind it was we thought, in, and on number six, increase in education spending would be more transparent to voters and taxpayers than any other way we could think of. Um, the increase would occur before the tax rate calculation. The increase in education spending would then flow. I feel like some people I don't, I never come in here and read things to you. I apologize. Um, the increase in education spending would then flow through to the district tax rate. The increased education spending drives up the cost per pupil and the increased cost per pupil increases the tax rate. That's how it would work. That's, that's the proposal that I came up with. Is it, is it fair, uh, appropriate to characterize this as a different kind of high spending threshold based on ratios rather than on per pupil, on merely on per pupil spending? Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I would, I would say it's similar to the high spending. Yeah, it's, 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 an, it's somewhat analogous to that, based on low ratios. It's a, <clears throat> I, I don't know what you want, want to call it, low yeah. ratio disincentive. Yeah. We've thought about it going, being essentially the same thing in another direction. In other words, another way of getting at the same, and maybe it would be duplicative. Yeah. So. I think, um, the notion that this committee has had is uh, in replacing, I mean, the high spending threshold is problematic. So thinking about new ways to do it, this being one way, yeah. I, I think our committee has looked at uh, the tax consequence of each dollar rather than having a threshold. It, in this case, it's 5.5 .5 to 1. Is that what you're Yeah, doing? that's what I was used for modeling. Instead of having a, a threshold saying for each dollar over the base calculation amount or over the yield that a district chooses to spend, there's a higher tax consequence than there currently is now. So that's what's in 9 11. Um, and the notion there is that um, because there's a higher tax consequence for each and every dollar over the base that a school district uh, spends, there's a higher tax consequence that people won't school districts won't spend right up to some sort of threshold and then and then stop there. 
that it's sort of, sort of free money up to this threshold, whatever threshold we put in place, and then there's this big penalty so people don't cross over the threshold. And that's kind of what's happening with with our high spending threshold currently. Is, is that right, correct? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I you know I'm one who deals with it all the time. It's it does get everybody's attention. It's again kind of like what I was describing here. It's kind of a blunt instrument. Um, it's not it, 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 to work better to be more tailor made to individual school districts. Um, that would take a lot of work. We have some ideas, but I just have never sat down and worked on it. Um, but it's when there's just a threshold. You're correct. Some some districts do go right up to just below that threshold. That's where they sit. So as the threshold goes up, they go. Yes. So you're correct. Yes, um, so, so along those lines, um, do you know, or I might ask you as well, do you know um, the reason why some of those school districts are at seven and some are at three, the ratios? I mean, have you uh, no. looked at them? I, I, okay. have, I have not had so, time to parse it out. So then my question is more around um, <laughs> sort of history of public education in Vermont. And, you know, we have, uh, you know, I grew up here, um, we've always powerfully supported um, public education, and, and I would say that this year we saw an awful lot of support coming from our districts for school budgets, 97%, I think, passed them on the first try. Um, I think we believe deeply in, you know, supporting our public education system. This is a pretty significant shift from that. It's taking decisions that we have always strongly supported at a local level, letting local voters make decisions. I mean, we let them make decisions about curriculum. We set the standards at the state board level, but we let them make decisions around curriculum and materials at the local level. And we've always allowed that in spending. This seems like a significant shift from for us um, heading in this direction, for, for Montpelier, frankly, to be taking over. Um, the staffing of our buildings, and I'm really struggling with that. Right. I mean, we spoke about this before. You know, Montpelier has taken over the taxing of our schools, so we feel that the state has a very direct interest in the operation <coughs> of schools. And, you know, I say that reluctantly, but definitively. I mean, we have a statewide tax rate. We have a statewide tax rate, so we have a direct interest in the resources we're putting in schools. So, Brad, do you have a district by district output of these? You, you, you showed the graph, so you you have that in a chart form. So uh, not with me. Look at my districts. Not with me. <coughs> Could you supply that to yes. me? Yes. Representative Webb has a question. Where have I struggled with some of this proposal? Is it seems like it's focusing on a symptom? as opposed to what's underlying the reason that some areas have low or high staff ratios, and that we at the state, I think, are probably wiser to focus on uh, the whys, what's driving those ratios, and addressing what it is that's driving those ratios. It, it's, it's like saying, just give everybody antibiotics without finding out that actually there's a you know there's an invasion of, of something, <clears throat> some disease that if you actually dealt with that, you might not need so much penicillin. I, I always get worried when I use an analogy. Um, <laughs> concrete steps come to mind. <laughs> <That's a funny laughs> concrete <one>. steps. <laughs> um, so when I hear this, I. I think that what we have been trying to do is actually focus on some of the things that are driving those costs, driving the reasons that we need staffing, uh, that, that we need to look at staffing. And I'm just wondering if the best use of what we could do now would be to see Act 46 through <coughs> get the special ed bill and, and census model funding in place bring in DMG, or excuse me, bring in uh, a group similar to DMG who uh, could help our schools look at uh, how to address some of our, our needier students. And then at the same time, acknowledge the school boards for doing what they did to not only reach the governor's goal, 
but to surpass it substantially. That would be what I would think we at the state, that would be the best use of our energy and time as opposed to getting into the nitty gritty of, of this counting that, you know, like I said, we can deal with it. Get rid of 21 paraeducators and hire 27 professionals. We've just managed your thing around ratios, but we haven't done a darn thing about cost. So I, I just, I, I, I can see where you could certainly set up some of this counting, which I think is appropriate, and counting it maybe the way you're doing it, um, and then use that as a measure of how we're doing, but not tying everybody to making those changes, but actually use it as a, use it as a measure as opposed to a, a, a policy. So, Brad, I... Um I appreciate your work on the methodology mm. here. I think it's it's pretty thorough and thoughtful. Um, my concern is, what do, how do we, what do we compare this to? Like, how does this compare to our private schools in the state? How does this compare to public schools in other states? Um, is there is there a way uh, to do that? I mean, do we do we have an understanding that 5.5 is the right number? No. Um, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing quite like this national. <coughs> excuse me, nationally. National data are looking at specific categories of, of teachers primarily, and that and and they're trying to come up with a a common methodology for all states so that they can actually compare them. But they have the same issues that we have trying to talk to districts sometimes and how they do things. It's, everybody does it a little bit differently. So the federal government's working hard, and that's sometimes why it takes two years to get information out, getting comparable data between the 50 states and the outlying districts. Um, is there anything that's looking at overall staffing versus just teachers? Not to my knowledge. There might, doesn't mean that there isn't, but not to my knowledge. I have not researched it. Is there anything that has gone to the level where I just did, where I said we're going to exclude these categories? Probably not. Um, what do we compare it to? Is that the right number? I, can, I can't answer that question. Um, I, I just, I, I can't. What about, what about teacher to student ratios? That's what I sort of hear the most about. Do we have do, do we know what that is in the state? And do, is that comparable to other states yeah, or that, to our private that, schools? That, that would be more comparable. Um, hard to believe, I'm sitting here laughing at myself now. It's hard to believe that did not actually look at the <coughs> teacher staff, the direct instruction versus versus students. Uh, it, I just didn't. I mean, I have it set up so that I can, but I it did not do it. Um, I can tell you what that is for FY18 with the direct instruction. And then follow along with that, what I said just a moment ago was I'll, I don't off the top of my head I do not know what the federal folks use when they're comparing across states for their for their staffing ratios that, that we see that it compares to but I could probably find that out and then I could probably see where, where we where we stand that would be helpful information I think for the committee and, 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 uh, and the question that representative long asked earlier I think it was representative long was, do we have any notion why some one school district is at 2.99 and another school district is over seven? I mean that's it's enormous. It, it is an enormous, enormous difference from one school district to another. My my guess and, and the answer is no. I have not looked at it. I've not taken the time to look at it because all this takes time. Time was not quite readily available for this. Um, but I think I think a lot of it's going to have to do with how supervisory unions are operated. Um, because remember, a lot of what we're seeing here is, is being pushed out from the supervisory and back down to the school districts. Yeah, yeah. So, and 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 then that that would involve rationale from, from folks that I know say, why do you have these people here? Why do you have this many people? We can find all this out. Not not happily, because they will be happy telling me this information. <laughs> but but, but we, could, we could find a lot of this out. Let me put it that way. Um, 
but but off the top of my head, I, I don't know. I could probably look at the towns and the districts and look at the staffing categories in the background data and come up with some reasonable ideas, but I truly don't know. And I have the feeling it's going to vary from place to place to place. Well, it, it may. On the other hand, we might see, you know, we talked about um, the number of uh, unified districts that we have. You know, if they're all in the lower half, and the ones at the very top are all districts that operate no schools and just do tuition. I don't. I don't have any reason to expect this. I'm not putting that out as an expectation, but that would tell us a whole lot about how uh, how the Act 46 process is updated or not. Um, it would tell us whether um, whether there's a differential between public schools and, and tuitioning out to to private institutions, in-state and out-of-state. I know one of the provisions we've got from the Senate is, is putting some small circumscribing around how we spend public dollars outside the state. So, you know, this is a good piece. It, it needs to have a lot more context uh, for me to understand how we might utilize this piece in a, in a piece of legislation. Representative Jim Batista. Uh, are you seeking... Oh, 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 I'm sorry, please. I forgot to. <laughs> well, let, let <clears throat> go, go ahead. ahead. And then you. Okay. Couple, couple questions uh, just raised from the proposal. Are you seeking legislation to put us on a long-term path? I know Secretary Young talked about a five-year plan uh, toward attrition. Is, is this the first piece of that proposal? Uh, this would be one piece of the proposal. Okay. Um, and so I'm wondering about this. You know, we're, we're trying to figure out how we conclude session in a timely fashion. Um, and so if you're seeking part of a package of legislation for future years, um, have you explored the future year impact of this proposal on the general fund? We have. Okay. Okay. Um, assuming that it's something that you can support based on the proposal before us, do you feel like it's appropriate under 5A, it says that the, the increase can be characterized as a fine, a tax, a penalty, or a surcharge on low student-staff ratios. Do you think the best way to get at this issue of ratios and wanting a statewide policy change would be instituting a fine, a tax, a penalty? Uh, like I said earlier, uh, this is, we're just trying to lay out some thoughts on this. We haven't come down on anyone. Yeah. I mean, our tax code is filled with <laughs> fines, penalties, taxes. Have, for example, the excess spending threshold. We have the allowable growth limits. Yep. Um, we have, I guess, if I thought fast enough, I could probably come up with a couple more. So, you know, this isn't foreign territory. Um, but the question that we have uh, in the administration and what we are hoping to figure out is what is the best way to do it? I, I was searching for a word there. I didn't <clears throat> have one. So I guess my only question then, if we're seeking enabling legislation this year for a five-year plan, um, within that legislation, would the governor be supportive of a fine, a tax, or a penalty on districts that have these ratios? So is your question, the governor has said he doesn't want a new tax, and is a tax up there? Is that what you're getting at? I'm wondering if... So we would yeah. figure out a way to not make it a tax, because it's not a tax. It's a penalty. <laughs> okay. Pardon me. Thanks. I mean, Representative Miller. Are you watching how Act 46 is continuing to do? Do you have an update on what the tax, the budgets have come in at of late? The last we heard from Mark was they've increased by 1.5, 2% less than a few years ago. Yes. It's 3.5. And that's saving us $28 million. Have you looked to see if it's getting any better, any worse? We, I, I updated those numbers maybe a week or so ago, um, and they haven't changed significantly. The, the ones who came in were smaller and didn't really move the needle at all. It's still around 1.5%. How many 1. Are still have, Brad? I think eight. How many? Eight. Eight? Eight. Well, that <coughs> is a sign of incredible success. I admit. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. I, I mean, the, the, the so, so if we if we can keep doing that, saving that 28 million each year, keeping the, keeping this down, 
And if we can be patient and see how the hard work we did here on special education comes out, as Kate so eloquently described, why isn't that a better idea than going into something so complicated that would probably drive the school districts crazy? Sorry to say well, that. But most of what I do does. Yes, <laughs> this constant changing things for them is just, I mean, they came through in such a beautiful way, such a helpful way this year. I think they have the message. So why not let these things <coughs> Why don't we just take our time and let's see how this comes out. This may solve our problem if we're patient. Uh, Representative Joseph. This, um, I don't want to teach you too much about this, Adam, but this thing might be called a tax. Would this be an increase in property taxes? No, actually, yeah. this proposal is to level property taxes. Oh, That's really? I thought they, the percentage increase, these, you're talking about percentage increases here. Right. Those are increases that will be realized through what? A percentage increase in, in property taxes? What the proposal does is it levels state the average statewide property tax. Oh, but, but, okay, but for the people who have the ratios that are low, they're going to have an increased property tax. And for people who have ratios that are high, mm -hmm. they will have a reduced property tax that otherwise it wouldn't, they wouldn't have. So the average statewide property tax rate will be the same. A master, Representative Kahn. Representative Kahn. Uh, so I'm going I'm to echo the argument for patience um, that Representative Miller made. I'm just looking at the. Um, four supervisory union school districts um, in my district and what happened this year uh, in um, Addison Northeast, uh, the district where Representative Sharp is from, they cut 16 and a half people. District I'm from, 23 people. <coughs> another district that's in my legislative district, 17 people. Um, another one in Addison County, uh, 14 people over the past uh, three or four years. Um, so I think that I got a little jumpy at the beginning of this when it said the proposal was to um, encourage districts to closely look at staffing levels and decrease them where necessary and possible, kind of uh, asking people to do what they seem to be doing a very, very good job of so far. Uh, but I couldn't help but bristle at that suggestion a little bit. Um, all right, that's pontificating. Uh, I do want to go back to... Um, uh, the question about enabling legislation. I mean, what is it you're talking about? You're suggesting get done for this year in this legislative legislative session. I'm unclear on that. You kind of said roll something out this year. Uh, we'd be happy if the committee is interested. We'd be very happy to roll this out ASAP. And this being essentially that, but in proposed bill form. I, I, just one more thing. Uh, I will say that. Um, I keep thinking about the unintended consequences. And so, for example, um, excluding special ed staff uh, sort of goes against um, the, um, our special education bill, which is really encouraging school districts to use their special education money in ways that are more effective. And sometimes that is to use specialists that, who aren't necessarily special educators um, to help target special education. Um, and uh, this would sort of provide a bit of a perverse incentive to you know, uh, not be creative and to keep things somewhat status quo. Right. I think Representative Miller, uh, question. In my district, we didn't come in at 1.2 percent. We, we were down by 1.2 percent in our budget. Our class, I check our enrollment numbers quite frequently in Shaftesbury. Our classroom sizes are 19, 20, 21, 22. We're doing a great job. Keeping control of costs and providing a quality education to our kids. Instead of going after everybody and annoying everybody, why don't you look at the people who are not achieving what you want? Why don't you go and look at That's the exactly what he's proposing to do. Look at the 2.99. That's exactly what you're going to find out why that is. Yeah. 
Are those the high spending tabs? Are they the special? Whatever the you going to do that? Is that's that what, what the said? proposal. Uh, the proposal yeah, that's what is the proposal to is? to have a penalty for what, low. What, what, no, I'm not what, saying what, no, no, penalty. What, no. No, no, I shouldn't say it's something different. You should say No, no, Representative Rhoda is saying something different. She's saying what is the reason behind these What numbers, is the reason? As opposed to oh, okay. coming do up with punishing. Yeah. Don't do anything punishing yet. Find out why, and then we can figure out what to do. But can I also, to the member from Middlebury, no, answer sorry, his I question? Formal. I'm sorry. Formal. You <laughs> moved? <laughs> 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 you know, it's kind of like... Just because everyone drives safely doesn't mean you don't need to speed limit. And those districts that are doing everything according to plan and whose plans are good, they shouldn't care. I mean, when I'm out driving, I don't care whether the speed limit is 55 or 60 because I'm a safe driver. Well, so this shouldn't annoy them. It shouldn't aggravate them. What we're trying to do, though, is to issue guidelines that perhaps some districts don't adhere to, and which has an impact statewide. So, anyway, thank you. Sorry. Representative Long. Don't we already have guidelines around student staff ratios? We have spoken about them over no, the years. No, I'm saying in statute, we have guidelines around student staff ratios. There, I know there are state board rules. Um, I believe school districts were to come up with a, a ratio of some right, sort, and I, I like four or five years ago. Yes, maybe. exactly, and I can't remember the I, exact I numbers, but I do know that we already have guidelines. Every every district is supposed to come up with a plan. That's right, depending on whether you're K-6, K-12, whatever you're um, office. Um, classroom size, I think they called it. Yeah. Um, Could you look into that, please? I'll, I'll try it again. Thank Optimum you. classroom size. Representative Jim Batista. I'm wondering about, in Secretary Young's memo from January, one of the five-year initiatives was to create a school consolidation commission to look at closing schools that weren't viable uh, because of ratios. Is that a piece that you think would be um, advantageous to pass into law this year to start a process to look at closing schools where districts may not be viable? Uh, I think, depending on what else passes, it may be worth looking into. But that may turn out to be superfluous if we can get through other legislation that will essentially um, have the same uh, impact. Okay. Other questions? Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Well, thank you for the audience. As you develop language, we'd love to yeah. see it. Poverty. And I, I think we need to create kind of a list of information that we'd like. I just added another not one. Not that you're not already <laughs> I was sitting around waiting for things to do. <laughs> I, I fully understand that you're busy over there in the area, and I, and I want to appreciate your work. Thank you. If, if he's looking, I, I just asked if he would add poverty to that list. Yeah. So thank you very much. So if I could draw the committee's attention to um, H27 for a few minutes. So I stood on the floor today to postpone for one legislative day. That means we need to take action. So um, can you do it again. Well, I could do it. Sure, you can. And yeah. I can, and I may have to, depending on what the uh, committee's thoughts are. Um, are we going to have testimony? Yeah. I know we, I know we have, that's the sexual <laughs> sexual. Yeah. Did we have testimony lined up for that today? Yeah. 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 We, we did. We yeah. did. But, we did? But, but since we go back on the floor, we may have had some of that canceled. Oh, yeah. We're back on the hour. floor. Yeah. Wait. Um, there, there was a, a walkthrough of 858 yeah. schedule for an hour if you would like it. With Jim, I just I can call him because of Tom. The folks for um for H27 are coming tomorrow at 10 o'clock. At 10 o'clock. Yeah. That's before we go to the floor. Correct. Okay. Correct. All right. So then, I'm sorry. Let's let let's have Jim do that walkthrough. Okay. You can do that before three. We'll be back on the floor at three. 8:58. Yeah. yeah. But, but my my head's up around 27. So we're going to take testimony in the morning. 
but before lunch, we need to take action on 827. So read it, decide what questions you have. We talked about it briefly on Friday. Yep. Possibly. Um, we'll out of our jurisdiction. Well, just because I asked the word teacher. Okay, well, it turns out they're pretty important right now. I guess so. And well, they should be. Well, we survived the heat wave in here, so that's why well, our choice is wide open. That's nice, right? Our choices tomorrow are to, to, to postpone yet another legislative hearing, to um, disagree and ask for a committee of conference, to agree with amendment where we propose an amendment. Um, or just plain to agree. So those are those are our choices for tomorrow on H27. So do our homework and be ready at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Thank you. And be open-minded to, to testimony. Since when is this committee not open-minded? Um, <laughs> yes, yes, Jeff. Uh, Jeff Francis, Rob, Superintendent Association. Very briefly, um, a lot of the education organization looked at that bill and there are substantive issues. The, the, um, our testimonies are already posted. Yeah. So the legal standards associated with immunity, we ran by school attorneys and they raised concerns that are reflected in our testimony. So you don't have to wait until tomorrow to read it. I don't think it's down to get down. I had to move it till tomorrow's okay. day. But the, Sorry, the testimony so it, just, so it doesn't show it's until tomorrow. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, really? You okay. can hand it out today. I'll hand it up well, today, right. if you want it today. Please. Yeah. It would be I'll hand it out at 3 o'clock. It would be helpful. I don't want people to be distracted away from what's about to happen next. <laughs> okay, how are you? Marge, when tomorrow will that go up? Like 7.30, 8 o'clock? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Or 6 a.m. or 7 a.m. Oh, so it will definitely be before 7.30. It was good for the trip. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Uh, I can find out. I'm sorry. It was yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's quite She was the chief of staff yeah. of Governor Brown. Oh. And she works in the administration. So we had Governor Brown gave the eulogy. We had Dr. Trump yesterday there. Nice try, but okay. So if you have to stop that, that's amazing. Yeah, I'm so nervous. 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 <laughs> okay, Jeff. Let's get let's get started. We have very limited time here. Okay, all right. Okay, so for the record, Jim, there we're as console. We're walking through H858, um, and so starting with the same as purpose. Yeah, up. Yeah, okay. the, the bill proposes to establish a process for the statewide negotiation of health care benefits for school employees and to establish transitional health care benefit terms for collective bargaining agreements with school employees to take effect on or after July 1, 2018, in order to ensure consistent school employee health care plans in advance of the statewide negotiation of health care benefits. First section, section one on line 17, is a purpose section, which reads, on December 18, 2017, the Vermont Educational Health Benefits Commission recommended that the state establish a statewide health care benefit be negotiated between school employees and the state in order to improve consistency and predictability in developing health care plans and rates and offer parity of benefits among all school employees. However, the Commission noted that the need for additional work in developing the parameters of negotiations and issues of income census, 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 some of the work for me. Sensitization. Thank you. <laughs> uh, the General Assembly deems it uh, to be in the best interest of the state to establish traditional health care benefit terms for collective bargaining agreements that school employees that take effect on or after July 1, 2018 in order to ensure consistent school employee health care plans in advance of statewide negotiations of health care benefits in 2022 and beyond. Section 2 uh, is an amendment to uh, Title 16, 
which is the uh, sec this is the section that deals with uh, collective bargaining for teachers and administrators. What it's doing uh, is in subsection B of line 19, is taking out uh, um, from the scope of negotiations health care. So it says, as used in this section, the, the term salary and related, related economic conditions of employment shall not include health care benefits or coverage. Uh, health care benefits and health care coverage, including health reimbursement and uh, savings accounts, shall not be subject to collective bargaining pursuant to this chapter. And then likewise, under the labor laws, this is section 21, I'm, I'm, I'm in section 3 now, on line 3, in P3. Uh, under the labor laws, there is uh, collective bargaining for municipal employees, which includes school, school employees. So if you're not defined as a teacher or administrator under Title 16, you're picked up as a municipal employee under this section, and it's doing the exact same thing. So it's taking collective bargaining out of the school um, for this purpose. So it says uh, on line eight, it's including a municipal school employee as a municipal employee. Jumping down for a second to line 18, it's defining a municipal school, municipal school employee to be an employee of a supervisory union or district, sorry, union or school district that is not otherwise subject to uh, Chapter 16, which we just went through. Sorry, I'm lost, gentlemen. So I just jumped down to the definition of municipal, municipal school employee. While you, while you paused, um, um, were you, did I hear you say that municipal school employees are not included in this bill? They are, so, no, but they had to be picked up in two places. So, okay. in, in Title 16, the first section, the second section we went through, yeah. uh, dealt with teachers yeah. and administrators. But administrators are defined to be pretty senior. Yeah. Other people like janitors and paraprofessionals, they are municipal employees, and they are covered by Title 21. Okay. So we have to do the same thing in two places. Okay, thank you. Yep. So, um, online 18, of uh, phase three is to find the term municipal school employee means employee of a, of a supervisor district, supervisor union, or school district that is not otherwise subject to the chapter, the section we just went through. So they're not otherwise a teacher or a administrator. So this is where you pick up the paraprofessionals and the janitors. Okay. So, yeah. so paraprofessionals, janitors, Bus drivers, yeah. everything that's not specifically a teacher or an administrator. Correct, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this is not a pre-existing definition, municipal school employee. We're, we're creating this definition. We're here. doing that because we're carving out yeah. uh, uh, from collective bargaining, bargaining around health care. Right. For other municipal employees, like the town ones, they would yeah. still bargain health care. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, so the next page, um, page four, uh, is where the carve happens. We were, just, we were just in the definition section. Now we're going to use those definitions. So section four, uh, line 10, says, for purposes of collective bargaining related to munis municipal school employees, as we just defined it, wages, hours, and conditions of employment shall not include health care benefits or coverage. Healthcare benefits and coverage, including healthcare reimbursement and health savings accounts, shall not be subject to collective bargaining by municipal school employees pursuant to this chapter. So it's doing the same thing here as we just went through uh, in top 16. Okay, next section five is uh, transitional healthcare benefit terms. The healthcare benefit and coverage provisions of a collective bargaining agreement between a supervisory union or school district and school employees that, that take effect on or after July 1, 2018, shall contain the following. One, a requirement that the uh, supervisory union or school district provide a premium contribution to an amount equal to 80% of the premium for the VHIGH quote consumer driven health plan, with school employees uh, responsible for the balance of the premium for the VHIGH plan they expect. And two, requirements that the supervisory union or, or school district contribute towards school employees' out-of-pocket expenses as follows. For each enrollee selecting a high deductible or high plan that is eligible for a health savings account, a requirement that the supervisory union or school district establish a health savings account to which it shall contribute $2,100 uh, per an individual plan 
$4,200 for a two-person or parent-child plan or $3,800 for a family plan. And for each enrollee selected, selecting a VHAC plan that is not eligible for a health savings account, a requirement, requirement that the SU or school district establish a health reimbursement arrangement to which it shall contribute $2,100 for an individual plan, $4,200 for a two-person or two-parent plan, for, or for a two-person or parent-child plan, or $3,800 for a family plan, and for which the school employee shall bear first dollar responsibility for the full amount of the out-of-pocket expenses for which he or she is responsible. Can I go back to line three on that page? Okay. So when you use the term here, school employees, you're including administrators, uh, teachers, Superintendents, uh, janitors, this new definition, municipal school employees, these are all included in these this. All in this included. Let me see, hold on. Um, yeah, so if you look on page six, line one, it says school employee means a teacher or administrator as defined in top 16 and a municipal school employee as defined in top 1. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, so that's where we are actually. Next page. So that was uh, line one is the definition of school employee, and, and uh, line four is supervisory union and school district have the same meanings as defined in Title 16. Section six uh, creates a study committee. So it says the study committee on statewide negotiations of health care benefits for school employee committee is created to determine how to transition to a single statewide health benefit plan for all school employees for our supervisory unions and school districts. The committee shall comprise the following six members. Three members, members of the House, now often the same party, who shall be appointed by the Speaker. Uh, and three members of the Senate, now often the same party, who shall be appointed by the Committee of Committees. If a member of the committee ceases to serve as a member of the General Assembly, a replacement appointee who is a member of the General Assembly shall be appointed in the same manner as the initial appointment. <clears throat> the committee shall propose draft legislation that addresses the following matters concerning the transition to a single statewide health benefit plan for all school employees of SUs and school districts. One, the structure and composition of, of parties to statewide negotiation. Two, a timeline for negotiations and impasse procedures. Three, a process for statewide ratification of the agreement resulting from the statewide negotiation. And four, how income census sensitization thank you <laughs> will be decided as part of the negotiations. The committee's draft list, list, legislation shall include the requirement that any fact finding required for impasse resolution shall give weight to the financial capacity of the school district, the interest and welfare of the public, and the financial ability of the school board to pay for increased costs of public services, including the cost of labor. Comparisons of the wages, hours, and conditions of employment of the employees involved in, in the dispute with the wages, hours, and conditions of employment of state and municipal employees who are not employed by SUs or school districts. Uh, the overall comp compensation received or currently received by the employees include direct related <coughs> fringe benefits and continuity conditions and stability of employment and all other benefits received and the rate of growth of the economy of the state of Vermont for the year of negotiation as well as during the prior three year period. The Commission will consult with the Secretary of Education and the Vermont uh, Education Health Initiative as necessary to receive uh, support from the Office of the Ledge Council. And the report is due on before November 1, 2019. Uh, to this committee, among others. November 15 or November 1? No, November 15, sorry. That's okay. Um, and the rest is just standard language. That's it. Takes effect on passage. So this, can I ask a question? Yeah. So this, under three and four on page seven, starting on line 15, that's outside of health insurance. I mean, we're, we're look, that's looking at stability of employment, other benefits. Um, I'm sorry, where are you? I, I'm on page seven. Line. 
I mean, this is about health insurance, but this is talking about comparing, looking at the comparisons of conditions of employment, things like that. Right? So it's getting outside of the... So it's looking at taking into consideration a, broader, a yeah, much yeah, broader yeah, than just yeah, health insurance. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Um, other questions? I'm looking at the makeup of the committee. Six members, three members of the house, not putting the same political parties. And three members of the Senate. Yeah, please do. Yeah. Um, I, I didn't even read this last page because it's not standard language. But if this committee, made up the way it is, um, wanted, they could actually make recommendations around things other than health care. Is that true or not? Um, I've trapped it. I'm sure they could. Okay. I'm sure they could. I'm not sure if that's expressed, though. Well, I'm just reading the purpose. I went back to the statement of purpose, and it's not, I mean, it leaves it vague enough, I think, so that this could actually get out of, you know. It, it's, that's usually made more, uh, it, I'm sorry, you mean the, the, the um. I, I'm thinking about recommendations that would come from that committee, and all the criteria we were just looking at, they, they, all the, so, still back on the. So by its terms, um, so on page eight, line eight, yeah, I didn't it's, get it's providing proposed legislation. <laughs> so that relates to um, healthcare matters. So by its terms, no, and that could be brought into include. But since it's legislative language, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can we go back to the default plan? Which I guess starts on page four, line 16, is that right? That's right, yep. Sets an 80-20 for all school employees on page five, uh, item number one, right? Paragraph number one. That's correct, yeah. But then later, oh, it, it doesn't set an income sensitization default, does it? That's, that's, right. Right. that's determined, I believe, right. by, by, by the committee. committee. Yeah. That's determined later, at a later date by yeah. the committee. Yeah. Fair to say that, that the model plan that they refer to would just basically stay in effect until the committee came up with a new idea and the legislature passed it. Yeah, well, so if you look at the language in page four, uh, 19 and 20, any um, effective bargaining agreement that takes effect on or after July 1, 18, would have to have these terms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's no end to those terms. So that would be, as you say, it would continue on until the new plan's in effect. Do we know how many uh, contracts this affects? Because it says on um, page four, line 18, 19. On or after this, so this would be, this would be um, 
before 19, right? Because the, doesn't the committee recommend what the what it's going to be for FY19? This is on Isn't that the idea here? I should probably ask Scott. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, uh, no, I don't think it says. It doesn't actually it say it. We'll pro provide proposed legislation. Yeah. By November. Yes. By November 19. Yeah. So actually, that would be for at the earliest fiscal year. 2021. 2021. 2019. Yeah. 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 21. Yeah. So there would be full, all contract would be up by, so by, by 2021, the earliest that the committee's proposal could go into effect, by that time, all school districts would be under the default proposed here. Is that correct? I believe that's correct because last year, when we passed Act 85, with the healthcare language, there was language in there around having kind of decided to terminate by a certain date. Yes. Right. Yes. I believe that was December of nineteen. Yeah. Maybe? So that means that when they renewed, they had to have these these new terms in them. Yeah. But there there were some districts I think that negotiated out beyond Long, that before right. that came down. Right. So there's there's, there's probably a handful out there that are not in that window. Number, yeah. yeah, it's a yeah. small number. But I think there were seven or eight districts that settled before that. I don't know. <laughs> Which of them were beyond yeah. 20 minutes? There were some. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, what testimony do you want to have here? Usual suspects. Right. Are we going to be getting a similar proposal that we're going to be take testimony on as yes. well? There's other proposals in the works, I think. Um, here's what I'm kind of thinking. Um, we have to get our miscellaneous bill, tax ed bill, miscellaneous ed bill, out of this committee in the next couple days. I don't think this, I don't think any school employee health care plan that we devise in this committee is going to be ready in two days. <laughs> yeah. Nor will it make a difference on the 30 to 50 million. But. So what I'm thinking is that we take maybe the composition of this committee, we pull out of this bill the composition of this committee and a, a uh, recommendation that they come back by uh, November of 18 with a health care plan for school employees. And we plop that into our miscellaneous end bill. That will give us uh, a germane hook that we can attach and we'll continue working on a school employee health care plan that we can put in place in conference or before, we, before we're done. Um, because we have to work among ourselves about what we think a good plan is and we have to talk to the Senate and we have to have conversations with the administration about what's acceptable and then in the end we put it in the miscellaneous ed bill and we get it across the finish line. That's my notion. Um, in the meantime, we need to take some testimony. We need to move forward on school employee health care. I don't think we can just let this sit. So I go back to my question, who do you want to hear testimony? Yeah. Where are you with the NEA proposal? I, I hope that's forthcoming. Um, I'll, I'll uh, see where that's at. I knew that I know that there was some language issues over the weekend. At some point, Peter and I have language regarding uh, regarding school statewide plan there. that we'd like to put in front of the committee. Yeah, yeah that can be part of it too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would. I, I, I don't propose putting a just a committee in the miscellaneous ed bill because I think uh, in, in an effort to avoid 
doing school employee health care. Uh, in fact, I'm thinking the other way around, that I'd like, very much like to do school employee health care. I just don't think we can, if, if we hold up the miscellaneous ed bill to do that, nothing will get to the finish line. That won't get to the finish line. We won't, we will have lost it. So by putting this, a little something in here that we can move out and move the bill forward and leave us with a place to put our plan in place when we come up with it is a path forward for us. So we want to hear from Scott and, and Peter. Uh, Peter. Peter and the School Boards Association. and the Superintendents Association, and uh, the VTNEA, and the uh, AFSCME. Sure. <laughs> um, VHOG. <coughs> Who else? Some of them are scheduled, I think. Pardon? Don't we have some of them already scheduled? We may. Come in. Do, yeah. do we need to hear from a member of the commission that existed, or are we moving forward? We're and, moving beyond the commission. Okay. Thank you. Some of those are just duplicated. I think uh, Nicole was on the right. commission. Yeah. The union? I got them down. Anybody else? Not the moment. Okay. Can you can you just explain to me again what you said about what kind of language that we're going to be using? Did you say we're going to be using this, or are we going to be looking at some other language and meshing them together? It's, I guess what I'm for today. Um, what I, what I just suggested was that we pluck the, the, the advisory board the out board, of here yeah. and just ask them to come forward with the plan in 2018, November of 2018. We put that in the miscellaneous agenda. Is that agreeable? <laughs> so will you put that in the next version of the miscellaneous said bill? Um, and, and I hope we have a version of that tomorrow that we can go through and, and tie up. I, I know we have to tie up some loose ends, so um, we need to get those tied up. All right, we're due on the floor in three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> 